Hey friends, Merry Christmas. My name is Jeff Henderson. I'm the director of FAI. And uh, man, I just had this burden to share a word uh, on and around Christmas that has been burning in my heart uh, the last few days. I don't really know what your Christmas uh, tradition is. A number of people, may maybe you don't celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Um, I mean, certainly we don't know the day that Jesus was born. Um, uh, I one time heard an old guy say that um, the best day to celebrate the birth of Jesus, the coming of Christ into the world, is every day. And I think that's a great answer. Um, but this is a time of the year where we do, for whatever reason, maybe it's just because of you know all of the secular celebrations and the lights and all that, we, we do have a, a, little, a little more narrow focus, a little more clarity uh, in our hearts, something within us that's thinking more about uh, the significance of this time of year. And, and frankly, for me, the, the ultimate significance of Christmas is Maranatha. The ultimate significance of this event is Maranatha. He came and he's coming. And that's really the core of what I want to get at today. I, I was thinking uh, as I was reading through a couple of verses, I've been doing a podcast with Stephanie Quick in the book of Galatians. And so I'm constantly going back through Galatians and just... Uh, the other day I was reading in Galatians 4 where it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. There's a time. There was a time called the fullness of time when God sends forth his Son, sends Jesus. And people have been waiting a long time for this. In fact, I would say this goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15 where God puts enmity between the serpent and the woman and between her offspring, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And this proto-evangelion, this first pre-good news, there's a time when it when it gets enacted. And, and this is what Paul writes about in, in Galatians 4. And each of the gospel writers introduces this, this concept uh, differently. I love how John writes about it in a way that is very much tied to the beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning uh, was the Word of God. And then ultimately the Word became flesh and, and dwelt amongst us. And I, I think the question that's been burning in my heart is, you know, what did it matter 2,000 years ago to the, to the Jewish people to whom Jesus was born into? What did it matter that he came then? And why does it matter to us today that Jesus returns. This is the twin sides of Maranatha, the past as we look about, look back to his, his, his birth and that he came into the world and he put on flesh. And as we look to the future that he one day will return and this forges and forms not only the urgency that we, we feel, but also the jealousy and the, the hope, the blessed hope, the longing in our hearts that, 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 that we would see this, that we would, that we would that he would come soon. And it causes us, it compels us. As we are in a place of waiting, like Simeon and Anna were so many, you know, thousands of years ago, waiting for the, the coming of the one who would be the consolation of Israel, the hope. We wait for our blessed hope to return. And this to me is is, is part of what I, I, I really, it just gets me fired up, you know, this time of year and why I wanted to come on and and share a message with you today. I'm, I'm thinking even th this evening of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, God, God didn't put the fire out for them. What he did instead is he put Jesus in there with them. It's not about God putting out our fires. It's about whether he's willing, and the answer is yes, he is, whether he's willing to get in there in those fires with us. And, and so, it's kind of what I wanted to uh, share this morning, or excuse me, this, well, I don't know what time you'll watch this, it's evening for me, um, but I was reading out of Luke 1, and, and really, I don't know why it hits me so hard, but when I read through the, uh, the encounter that, that Mary has, the mother of Jesus with the angel Gabriel, um, man, just something really powerful hit me. There's, there's this concept. I, I think the, the word for it is uh, liminal or liminality or liminal space. And what the word liminal is, I think, a Latin word for threshold. The idea or the concept of liminality is these transition seasons in our life where we're between two things. And so, and we're waiting, you know, we're, we're kind of anxiously awaiting for this next 
thing to come. And, you know, I, I've, I've thought of it at times as like being between, if you're walking between two train cars and you leave one train car and the door shuts behind you and you can't go back, but the one ahead of you, the car that you want to get into, isn't that door isn't yet open to you. You're in a liminal space. You're in between. And very much so Advent and waiting and expectation is about being in this threshold place of, of, of being in between. And so I want to, uh, I'll read this passage uh, out of Luke 1 and then just maybe share a few thoughts that I have about what it is, what it means for us to live in this place, I believe, of perpetual advent, waiting, hoping, expecting. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua. He will be great and, he, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Come, King Jesus, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. He will rule over an unshakable kingdom. And in verse 34, Mary asks, how will this be uh, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And I love, I love this introduction because we, we find out later when Mary goes to be with Elizabeth and Mary, who's pregnant with, with Jesus, and Elizabeth, who's pregnant with Jesus's cousin John, when they, when they meet, John in his mother's womb leaps inside of his mother's womb. And I, I, I just think there's something so deep about this. When we... When we encounter Jesus, when we really encounter him, something should and does leap inside of us. Um, and so Mary, in response to this encounter, says back in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, and may it, may it be, or let it be to me, let it be unto me according to your word. Man, I just think this is this is such a significant way to talk about what it looks like for us to be in this place of waiting uh, for the Lord, for us, you know, this urgency that we feel for the, when we cry Maranatha, this is why Maranatha is such a beautiful word, such as a perfect word to be our central cry, because as we cry, we're literally the spirit and the bride say, come, come Lord. These are, these are the final words we hear humankind in, in, in the word of God crying out, you know, come Lord. And there are these themes that, that go from kind of, I would say, a Genesis to Revelation sort of reality of waiting, of Advent, that are not necessarily tied to Christmas. They're, they're bigger and broader themes about what it means for us to be formed and forged in, in, our, in our faith. And one of those themes is the desert or wilderness, which I think is fascinating that this is such a place of waiting or a threshold place when God wants us to move from one place to another. Maybe it's from, from captivity to freedom, or maybe it's an entry into ministry, um, that he will usher us into a place of wilderness or desert and, and, and have us there waiting uh, until we're introduced into this, this next season. Uh, the pit or grave uh, is kind of the liminal posture of our heart, the advent, the, the expectant place of our heart. Even the sacrament of baptism is, is it, you might think of it as the sacrament of in-between, where we go under the waters of baptism to represent our death, and we come back up out of the water to represent our resurrection. And there is this idea of us going down into the grave, awaiting uh, the redemption uh, e even of our bodies. And then this third kind of adventy, liminal waiting theme is the theme of exile or pilgrimage. You see this uh, throughout the Bible, those who God sends on mission. Uh, I think of Abraham. I think of Hebrews chapter 12, where it says that all these who by faith followed God, even though they didn't receive 
uh, the, the, what they were what they were promised. They they lived in the land as foreigners and as strangers, and they lived in this place of exile and pilgrimage, and maybe of adventure. And this season that we're in now, the, the, the Christmas season, the time of Advent, it always kind of, like I said earlier, it becomes more crystal clear to me, like the focus of this, and even the, the I, I, you know, I, this is a weird analogy, but I, I've often said, you know, it's like being a pregnant woman. I feel like this third trimester sense of expectancy this time of year, not just reflecting upon the on the beauty and, and my thankfulness that he in fact did, as, as Paul says in Galatians 4, he did in the fullness of time come into the world. He, he, the word became flesh like me and dwelt amongst us with me. I mean, this is something that I'm, I'm fascinated by, but my heart really starts to leap about this year or, or this time of year is is this idea of Lord come, and while the this in between place can be a place of beauty and hope, it can also be a place that's not very comfortable because there's oftentimes unfamiliar roads and 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 the language is different, and there can be new landmarks, new things that we're experiencing as we're on this journey to something new, and without a doubt, you know this that, uh, that Advent is a is a waiting time and. It's the time that exists between the miracle of conception that is prophesied over Mary and the gift of birth that will come, you know, nine months later for Mary. It's the time of hints and suggestions, and it's the time of awaiting fulfillment. It is the beauty of, uh, we see the joy in a kid's heart waiting for, counting down the days on an advent calendar until they can open their gifts it, it, you can't force the days to go faster. You Advent, the season of waiting, this birth won't be rushed. It will come in the fullness of time. And so the question for me becomes, well, how do we inhabit this space? How do we live in this space of, of waiting, even as we wait for the return of the Lord? And I'll give just three really quick suggestions as to how I think we can maybe step our way through this, this time of pilgrimage as we wait for our blessed hope. One, step one, and I get this from Mary's response. It's just simply surrender. When the angel Gabriel comes to announce to Mary that she was about to be catapulted into the in-between, between, between the, the in-between mystery of divine expectancy, she replies, let it be to me, uh, unto me according to your word. I, I surrender all that I am to this word. Uh, let it be unto me according to your word. And that space, this waiting space for us, it isn't passive. It isn't, most of the words of waiting that we, we encounter in the scriptures are not passive, but active words. And I, I always share the analogy. This isn't, it's not like when you go to the doctor's office and you check in and you're sitting in the chair and you're reading a, you know, a three-year-old National Geographic waiting for your name to be called, knowing that just on the other side of the wall, there's a doctor there and the care that you want and that you need is, is it, it's just there. It's just not that far away, but you can do nothing but sit in the chair and wait. So you just sit there and do nothing. And most of the waiting that we're called to, the advent that we're called to, the liminal space, this in-between place that scripture elicits is not just a, a place of, of passivity, but it's a place that becomes fruitful when we surrender to it and we enter into it with it, with an expectancy that says, Lord, I'll let it be unto me according to your word. I'll wait here as long as it takes, but I, I want to go. I want to see what it is that you're, you're bringing you know, next. When we put down our own kind of willful determination to be in control and to need to be in control and we surrender all of our demands that life be predictable and comfortable and reassuring. Um, that's to me, step one. Step two of the journey through this space of waiting is to stop. It's just extremely important that we would find times in, in the midst of our muchness and manyness and our busyness. And man, I really struggle with this. I, I enjoy going at a fast pace. I enjoy being busy, but I hear the Lord calling me particularly in this season to stop and be still and to take a breath, not to panic, not to rush through or resist the, the, the awkward uncertainty of not knowing um, what it is exactly that God's doing or when it is exactly that he's going to do it. And when, um, when we are unable to do this, we, we will, when we 
when we can't stop, when we, when we find ourselves unable to stop, but we're just perpetually rushing through no matter what it is, we end up losing touch with the power and the beauty of all that God is doing in these in-between times, of getting us ready. And, and even now, as, as we feel, as an organization, as I feel uh, a greater urgency pressing in to, to long for his return, to not just want him to come back, but to, but to, to feel you know, great love for him, great joy at the idea of him returning. At the same time, I, I want to stop and just take in, Lord, what is it that you're doing in this season? And then the, the step three is, well, step one, surrender. Step two, stop. Be still for a moment. Step three, be patient. I, I like the way that Joel Richardson says this. He says he prefers uh, long-suffering to the word patience, and I, I agree with him. I think, I think the idea of us being invited into the participation or the fellowship of, of the suffering of Jesus means that we're willing to suffer like he suffers. And, and he has been suffering uh, from before the foundations of the earth, knowing that he would drink the whole cup of the wrath of God, knowing what would come for him, and knowing um, that he'd have to wait and see um, this cycle of acceptance and rejection. And as the, as the gospel foundations are laid with his people, Israel, and the rejection that, the, that, he, that he feels every time someone says no to the call that he has in their life to come unto him, to lay down their burdens at the foot of the cross and to receive him as Lord and Savior. And so the, the, the long-suffering step three that I would call us to is that we would, just as I said earlier, look to see how Jesus is at work in the midst of uh, a suffering world, in the midst of uncertainty and doubt and confusion and unknowing and fear and all the things that we see going around us, in the midst of all of that, Advent calls us, this season, this time, this period, this Maranatha um, cry. It, it isn't just a cry for Jesus to come. It's a reminder to us that we are, we are called to the place of calm, that we are to be the anchor, that we are to be the place of refuge for those who have no hope, who only know fear, who have no certainty. Um, I, I just lost a friend. I just went to his funeral yesterday. And he was a dear, dear brother in the Lord, a powerful pastor and evangelist. And as he was in his last days, some doctors that came to him as he was, uh, he had, he had a, a, a cancer. And these doctors came into his room and said, look, you know, there's some things that we can talk to you about that, that could extend your life. And he said, really? Extend my life? He said, that's fascinating. He said, um, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. I, I have the gift of eternal life. He's like, you, you can extend that? <clears throat> you can give me something that adds on to eternal life? And he said, look, I, I, I think I'm good. He said, but I have a question for you. Do you know the Lord? Do you have the gift of eternal life? And to be able to look into the face of something as, as ever-present, as, as how vaporous life is, to know that your death is near, and to be looked to look back into the world to those who maybe don't know him and to have the patience, the long-suffering nature in that moment to have hope and to be able to offer a message of hope is what I think it means to, to reside in the midst of uncertainty and to have a, a calm, a peace that passes understanding where the beauty and the tenderness of Jesus Christ resides. And so ultimately, uh, this is what I wanted to to call us to at this time of year, the hope, the wonder, the joy. Again, I'm not here to tell you, you gotta do this on December 25th. I love my old mentor buddy who said, the best, <clears throat> the best day to celebrate the birth of Jesus is every day. The best day to celebrate and long for his return is every day. And so, brothers and sisters, during this, this time of year that we call the Christmas season, I wanna call us to the Maranatha joy and the Maranatha cry that we all share together. And so let's pray. Father, um, we love the fact that there, there is a concept called the fullness of time. And in the fullness of time, you, gave, you sent your son to this world through this willing woman, this young, vulnerable teenage woman who was willing to surrender uh, her own way in life to your will. 
who's willing to say, let it be unto me according to your word. And Lord, we, we join that prayer and say, let it be unto us according to your word. And we thank you, Father, that not only was there a time, a fullness of time in which you came, but there is a time again where you're, where you're coming. And I just want to flip back into, the, into those last words because I believe the most significant uh, Maranatha cry uh, that we could offer you, Lord, at this time of year are the very last words. We hear you saying, behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Merry Christmas.